Happy Monday, everyone. I trust you all had a great Lord's Day yesterday. Um, so much going on, and I've got papers. You don't even want to see the top of my desk. But um, I just want to um, clarify a few things from my previous video. Got lots of comments, um, many great ones, some very nice comments as well from folks. Um, and I appreciate you all so much, some of you chiming in with some dates to look at and some counting to consider. Um, so I want to clarify what that video was about, if I can, a little bit more and drill down a little bit more to what I'm looking at and some dates. Um, again, what I was looking at was uh, not so much to uh, fix a date, although that would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, I guess whoever does that, it'll be historical once they're raptured and we find out that they had it right. <laughs> but um, you know, I don't. I don't look for that to be to be me. I just know. I just know that we are within the season. You can feel it in the air almost, really, can't you? Maybe that's just the Holy Spirit within us, um, and we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, or we should be if if we are prayed up and we are in the Word. Um, we just can look at the world around us. The world's always had wickedness in it, and the world has always had evil in it. But um, there's a, an electricity in the air, I think, for a lot of believers. A lot of believers just know that um, uh, exactly if they can't put their finger on it, that there's just a, a sense of anticipation and... Um, I don't want to see uh, anxiety, but anxiousness in a sense of excitement um, about you know the anticipation of wanting to go see the Lord, wanting to go um, meet the Lord and get out of this earth and and get away from all the evil here and get away from our own um, sinful proclivities and attitudes and holiness and unholy thoughts and things we do and. And if you want to find out if you're walking in holiness and if you think that you, maybe you walk in holiness um, every day, then maybe you're not driving on the freeway often enough. Um, no, but, I'm, but seriously, though, um, we, if we're God's children, we, we should be dismayed with our own um, sinful thoughts and things that we're capable of, capable of thinking and... and um, and whatever so uh, I just want to walk with Jesus I want to go be with him I want to go meet him in the air and I'm so excited about that but so we come around and every year there are certain seasons high watch seasons and uh, this year I thought you know I'm, I'm just tired of this whole calendar thing and trying to figure out count the days and what days should we be should we be looking at and so that's why I made the video I made, um, and we're a few thousand, few thousand um, visitors on it so far. And I think that's the highest I've ever done. And now all that does is tell me that people, it just confirms what I was just saying, that everybody is anxious to, we want to go meet the Lord. Maybe this guy here has got a clue. I'm sorry, I, I don't, I've got some clues. I don't have the answer. I don't have a date. Uh, I think anybody who tries to tell you that they have the date definitively is selling something. We've seen how that fails in the past, and, and don't do that. And I'm not going to try to um, come down with some high and mighty word from God, or I had a dream, or I saw a vision, and God gave me some dates, and I'm seeing some faces, and I'm seeing some numbers, and I'm seeing a calendar, and I'm seeing a, a, you know, a coffee mug with a date on it. Um, this one's got a date on it, and it's today because it expires today as soon as I drink it all down. But there's a lot of that out there, and, and just be cautious. And, and if you're doing that, um, you ought to think twice because God thought seriously enough about prophecies and false prophecies that if somebody came up with a prophecy in the Old Testament days... Um, we're talking mosaic times and also moving forward. And they did not come true that that person was to be taken out and stoned. I'm not advocating that we need to bring up stoning again. 
although some of you might agree that there are a few out there that probably need some stoning, but, you know, they stand in God's judgment, and we pray that there are many people out there who really need to repent who are abusing the Word of God. I don't want to be abusing the Word of God, and I do not want to be um, making false prophecies. We need to be careful about that because God cares enough about it that he would um, have people stoned for making prophecies, and, and even if just one did not happen, that was enough to be stoned. So, don't do that. We um, People are ex excited as it is, and, and the only reason why I could think of where people do this is, one, is you're sincere, and you um, really did have this dream, but you know what? If, if you go to bed with something on your mind, or you just, sometimes you've just watched a TV show or a documentary, or you just read something in a book, or you've read something in the Bible or whatever, and you go to bed with these things on your mind, there's a really good chance you're going to have a dream about it. That does not mean it's from God. Um, the Bible does say that in the last days, um, men will um, dream dreams and see visions and all this. People like to go and quote Joel. And that, that is true. But when you look in the context of the passage that's mentioned, it is it's during the tribulation period. And it's, it's during this time when... Um, the tribulation is known according to Jeremiah, and I mentioned this in the last video, I'm sure of it. The tribulation is about the salvation of the Jewish nation. And according to Jeremiah, it said it is the time of Jacob's trouble. Who is Jacob? Remember Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob's name was later changed to what? Israel. Correct. So it's the time of Israel's trouble. The prophetic time clock in the first century for Israel stopped. There were some prophecies about them being scattered to all the countries of the world, and that happened in the first and second century. Um, somebody tried to make a comeback in about, I want to say it was 135 AD, and that did not go very well. The, um, the Roman Emperor booted those people back out again and had Jerusalem um, the streets and, and so much of it plowed under and that's when they decided to name it Palestine. Um, there's no Palestine officially in the Bible um, or in history until then. That's when it became Palestine. He hated Israel so much that he wanted to rename the land and wanted them out. So the diaspora and that's the end of prophetic history other than the mention of the, the church and times for the churches and so forth. And Jesus gave us the seven letters to the seven churches um, that gave us a glimpse in, into uh, church history and church behavior and so forth moving forward through time. But for Israel, that pretty much, that's it. Uh, right around then, there's, there's nothing else about Israel until the Old Testament mentions that God says, I'm gonna, I will bring you back a second time. The first time he had to bring them back is when they were scattered um, because they were captives to uh, the Babylonians and they were brought out of the land and they were enslaved uh, for 70 years and the Lord brought them back as he promised he would, prophesied he would. And then he mentions that um, they would be scattered among the nations and he would bring them back a second time. That didn't happen at all in history. In fact, most biblical scholars said, Maybe it was symbolic, you know, it's, it was a metaphor for something. <clears throat> it was, uh, you know, we, there are very few that, that and we can name some of them. There are very few that said, no, no, I think this is going to happen literally. Um, and, and it did in 1948. Um, you know, has anybody ever seen such a time as this when an ancient nation was completely gone, obliterated, wiped off the face of the earth, and it was nothing but desert? And then it came back, and now it's a garden spot. And the Lord said he would do this, and then he also said that when he does this, uh, that they would never be scattered again. And that Israel, that uh, they would walk where their fathers walked forever and ever. So once he brought some, brings them back in a second time, they're there. <clears throat> and they're there to stay, stay. But they've never possessed all of their borders. They've been within their borders. They're, they're within their borders now, right? If you're standing, it's just one guy standing within within the city of Jerusalem. He's within the borders, but not all the boundaries that were given to Abraham when the Lord set him on the mountain, told him to look as far as I could see and turn around and look and see, and he gave him the borders. 
and um, described the borders. And uh, they've never possessed all that land, and they will not until the second coming. When Jesus returns, sets his foot on the Mount of Olives, and it splits, and fresh water runs out. Uh, and, and Jesus says, behold, I'm making all things new. And he's recreating everything. He's restoring everything. And we have the kingdom on the earth as he establishes it. And Jesus sits on the throne of David in Jerusalem. Remember, remember, um, remember uh, David was never in in heaven um, on a throne. David's throne was in old Jerusalem. Um, and that's where Jesus' throne is going to be established. So um, bear with me. Again, I'm kind of a little bit of a tickle here. I'm still trying to flush this cold out. But I want to I go through some things here um, and point out some dates and things that I was, I was referring to. But before I do, a lot of the questions that are being asked and people are making comments on, um, I've made notes on them before. I have taught some Bible studies before. Let me show you some things here um let me go back out of here this is a timeline we're going to get to that here in a second let me try something here um this is this is tricky here with the software so like i said please bear with me but there we go um it's my youtube channel when you're watching a video if you look at the bottom of the video there's described at the bottom of it like uh you know we we go down here here's the one that i just did um if you click on it you will see where you can click on a name and that takes you to the channel okay so that's anyway so that is the the channel that um i'm on now let me see if i can go back and i might not be able to oh let me go back in here okay so when you first land on the site here we are um here's apocalyptic and thousand it's just a little introductory video i started doing a series of videos on that all millennialists object to with premillennialism so i started answering some of those questions let me pause that it's annoying because my lips don't match because that's a video it's a recording anyway you go down for those of you who are uninitiated, there are some playlists. If you can view the full playlist, and you can pick some out. This one's on the fig tree, tree generation, and it's a combination of a couple of different um, video Bible study series that are combined. If you wanted to look at that topic and watch material that has to do with the fig tree and what the, the final generation means, that generation, and so forth. Um, there's a, a, a little playlist here about um, the, the Olivet Discourse, mostly from Matthew 24 and how it impacts the book of Revelation and how they work together. Here's a full playlist of the entire book of Revelation. So if you click on that, view full playlist, I'll click on that right here. Now it opens up and you can see um, quite a few studies, Gog and Magog, um, and things about Babylon and so forth. So you can pick and choose some of these. There's some in here about um, the Antichrist and so forth. So take a look at that. Oh, look at New Jerusalem. Um, so a lot of the questions that you might have in your mind, take a look at that and see what you see what you think. But I, I go into the trumpet judgments and the seal judgments um, section by check section. Um, chapter by chapter in the book. Here's one, um, notice the graphic on here, uh, session 19, ancient Hebrew wedding tradition. The ancient Hebrew wedding tradition really does inform the rapture and all these events um, so much. It's well worth the study if you've never done it before. And um, it definitely speaks to a pre-tribulational rapture. So I, I encourage you to do that sometime. Um, now let, me, let me bounce out of here, but that's how you that's how you get to it. That's how you get to the playlist. A lot of the, I, I hope it blesses you. Um, again, my perspective is premillennial, um, pre-tribulational rapture. 
And um, I think most people popping on here are of that belief. I do answer some questions that have to do with all millennialism and post millennialism and, and their objections, answer some questions and objections that they have to premillennialism because they think we are wackadoodle because we believe in a rapture because the word rapture is not in the Bible. And then I like to reply, and you've probably all heard it one time or another yourself. Guess what? The word Bible is not in the Bible. So I want to answer some of these questions um, that I've gotten over the last couple of days and try to clarify this timeline a bit. So speaking of which, um, let me get back to where was that? Here we go. I want to get back to this and look at this timeline a little bit. Um, because I can get some things out of the way here. So I have too much open on my computer screen right now. And I appreciate you folks. You've been very kind. So the kind remarks and, and patience with uh, the weird funny math and things like that that I'm looking at. And I hope it's not too funny a math. Um, sometimes when I, when I speak about funny math, I've been known in Bible studies to pull up uh, a video of um, Abbott Costello and doing some funny math and 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 coming to some weird conclusions, you know, writing down in a column and coming down and, and coming up with some weird things. And, it's, and the answer is obviously wrong, but it's the way he does it. It's quite humorous, but a lot of folks out there are doing funny math. and I don't want to do funny math. What I want to do is real math, and this is why I'm asking for some help. I cannot find some some good um, calendarizing type of software out there where you can customize a, a calendar. We're only dealing with, you know, if we could look within a, about a decade here, um, because what I, it would be great to do, it would be great to be able to um, lay out a, a roughly a decade and to look at the years 2023 all the way up to 2030 and then look at 2024 up to 2031 and to look at we should to do this honestly we should look at a few spans to see what makes sense now i know i know uh some folks have some ideas about with, with the shemitah and all these other things well how it can't be passed here because this date is here and so we can't go past a certain date and it's got to be this date or it's got to be that date but um i I understand this. I understand this thought. And 2030, because, you know, we got this 30 thing going on, and, and Jesus was crucified in the year 30 and so forth. Let me just say, um, you know, I studied that for a while. And we've we got to understand that on three major occasions in history, our calendar changed. Um, you know, we know about we're in the Gregorian calendar right now, used globally, and Pope Gregory messed that up. But there are a couple other times when the calendar has changed too, and the Hebrew calendar has been changed, and it really messes things up because it throws us off by a good couple of years. Um, the way I came down onto it was was figuring out. I was trying to figure out, for instance, the crucifixion of Christ. So many people have done sharper, better minds than mine, and we know about Anderson's calculations and some things that worked and some things that that didn't work out too well. Um, some things that did, but then you've got there's no way that, you know, Jesus was in the grave three days and three nights if you have a Friday crucifixion as the Roman Catholics, you know, tried to assert so long ago because they didn't read and study their Bibles very well uh, back in those days. Now, the, the folks in the church, they had no choice but to run to the priests because the priests had all the answers and they weren't allowed to have their own Bibles back in those days. So it's not like the people, many of them. Um, got a hold of a Bible and did the studies themselves, and so they were, had a lot of bad information. And if you did get caught with a Bible in your hands or doing any of that stuff, you were probably going to be, uh, you know, tortured, jailed, killed, you know, martyred, that kind of thing too. So a very horrific time in history. You know, the Dark Ages are replete with stories. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs sometimes. It's well worth the read. Um, you, everybody should read that. Every believer should get a hold of the Fox's Book of Martyrs and, re, and read that. But anyway, um, I digress, as I want to do. Um, but the dates did not come out right, because when you look at the Hebrew calendar, 
when you get to the point of Jesus being crucified, you remember uh, the days of the week, um, the night and the day are when the Hebrew calendar works. So, um, Nisan 14 going into 15 for the Passover, Passion Week. Um, it happens at sunset. We had Jesus go um, to the cross at uh, like um, 9 o'clock in the morning and all that happened and he was crucified and how long was he on the cross and 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 they had to be taken down um, off the cross and had to make sure he was dead we know the story I'm, I'm hyper jumping here because uh, tomorrow is the Sabbath so in, in the minds of the Western thinking Roman Catholics at the time they're thinking oh tomorrow's the Sabbath so they thought that uh, well that means that Jesus was on the cross on Friday because they're saying tomorrow's the Sabbath well, no, on High Holy Days, you have Sabbaths a couple times during the year, during the week. And it, it can land, you know, whenever on that date, because it's a High Holy Day. Um, but we have to look at that Nissan 15 and Nissan 14 and when that happens. So anyway, I, I couldn't get them to reconcile because you, you determine these things by looking at the full moon or looking at the new moon. We have the NASA data and I took software and I, I ran the dates forward and backward and looked at every possible way. I looked through um, uh, Astro Pixels was one website I went to, and you can go through and look at new moons, full moons. You can look at the whole um, lunar system going all the way back um, easily into the first century, and you can see how those dates land. Um, so I'm looking, and it didn't match. And then I find out that at Council of Nicaea, that uh, they also changed the days of the week because there was a Roman calendar, and they need to justify changing it. So what part was one of the things they did, and um, so they were trying to harmonize the Byzantine calendar and and the Julian calendar, um, and they were trying to because they were drifting apart from each other. They had no regard for the Babylonian or Hebrew calendar because, as far as they're concerned, eh, those people are dead. You know the 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 Jews, the Hebrews, they were scattered to the to the winds. They didn't care what those calendars said, regardless of how accurate they they were, or whatever at the time. They didn't regard that. That was not even a question. They're looking at the, the uh, Roman calendar and the Julian Roman calendar was uh, eight days a week. Um, you know, they had a market day and so forth, and they're trying to get these all to crunch together. So ultimately, they ended up kind of arbitrarily saying that, you know, let's just declare today's Wednesday. Okay, everybody good at that? Let's uh, everybody in favor say aye. It wasn't that quite that simple and worded that way, but but they um, they did that and they decided they they drew a clear line and said this is it. This is the day that we are on right now that's from henceforth and forever it's going to be this date you know smack the gavel whatever they did i don't know what they did uh snap a gym towel i don't know what they did to <laughs> declare uh forgive me i'm getting silly because i've been you know up a lot of hours and so forth and staying but anyway um and a little humor i hope breaks up the time because you know, I know this isn't necessarily that particularly exciting to watch or listen to me babble on, speaking of Babylon. Um, and I, I like puns, so I'll, I'll try to be merciful, though. Anyway, um, so without complete, without any regard at all for the Hebrew calendar, what they did is they declared a certain day and they drifted the Hebrew calendar by three days. And what does this mean by three days in what direction? Well, let me put it this way. If you, if you want to... This will short circuit the brains of uh, sacred name people and Hebrew roots people. I'm sorry to do this to you, but if you want to worship on the same Sabbath day as the first century Christians did, as the same Sabbath day that Jesus worshipped on, um, you want that Sabbath day, you better do it on Tuesdays. That's just the way it is. They changed the date. Our calendar's off by three days. So once. I had all that um, worked out. Here's a calendar that demonstrates, that shows some of this. This is interesting. Um, and this is from a, a, a cool guy on the internet who actually did the same kind of research. I think it's the right angle here because the camera's at a weird place over here. So, uh, yeah, so see what they did? And, and kind of messed it up so it changed the days of the week are all kind of messed up so he's trying to correct this here and he did a great job with it and it saved me a lot of labor and things but um this is very cool um but it's not cool for people who think that they're 
keeping the Torah perfectly. And if they, especially if your works only didn't think you got to keep the Torah to, to go to heaven or God's going to push you out of the gate. Bummer. You know, I, I hope folks jumping, jumping on here will repent of that if that's your mindset. Then I got to say, you know, do you ever, um, do you ever wear a, a cotton poly blend? Because guess what? You're breaking the law if you're doing that. Because according to Hebrew law, you couldn't blend fabrics and materials like that. Oops. You know, the law, as Paul said, I'm not going to go down this road right now because we just don't have the time. But reread Romans and reread what Paul said. He affirms this, that the law is a schoolmaster, that the law is there to teach us that we need the Messiah, that we need a Savior. That's the whole point of the law. We can't be perfect. Stop trying to keep it. Um, I mean, you should try to keep it. If you love the Lord, you want to try to... Uh, it reflects his character and his nature and what he desires. But stop trying to get to heaven by keeping the law. We should try to keep the law as, as our sanctification, being set apart for him, but not to try to get into the pearly gates. Um, that's a non-starter. But again, I digress. So, um, so anyway, when you take this into account and you go back and you look and you correct the days of the week and when Nisan... 14 and Nissan 15 starts, what you find is that Christ went to the cross on a Thursday in 32 AD. And it lines up and fits perfectly. And he rose on Lord's Day, what we call Sunday and so forth. Now, here's the thing is the calendar is so messed up. Um, I'm not saying that 30 AD is wrong for when Jesus went to the cross. If you're, if you're trying to count forward from Genesis and do all this fancy footwork, our calendar is so messed up that what we understand is 32 AD today, right now, where we sit watching this video. It might be, going back into time, it might be the original 30 AD. It might be. The calendar might be off by, that might be it, two years. So, I mean, when you consider that, you know, it kind of makes sense. So anyway, um, back to this scrolling globe thing going on down here really, really fast. You know, if the world were spinning that fast down underneath, we'd be, we'd be flying off into space. Um, let me pause this for just a moment. Ah, where am I? Okay. Is this showing up? I, I hope the cursor is showing up on the camera. I see it on my computer. I hope it does because I'm going to point to some things and I hope it shows up. That's what I'm trying to click on and make sure I'm doing. So um, make sure I can do this okay. All right. So what I'm trying to show is when I counted out um we know some main dates as i showed in this original chart um you know what i i think i can go there i think we'll go like this no do you do that i think i've got too many things open and here where to go yes Okay. Do, do, do. Well, I'll get back to I'll find it here in a second. Um it's a wonder anything of clarity can come out of this mind at all right now. Um but what I was originally talking about was we know from the scriptures in Revelation in particular, there are some time segments that are mentioned. Um, I, I'm just I'm just kind of looking at my version of the chart with all my chicken scratches here. That's all I'm looking at here. Uh, so we know that we had the uh, 1260 days. We have the 1260 days that the two witnesses are upon the earth. So what I did was to figure out when they started or whatever. We know when that when it ends for their ministry. So I, I think we can stick a pin in when their ministry ends by looking at um, 
reading the scriptures in um, Revelation chapter 11, it talks about there's war in heaven, or chapter 12, there's war in heaven. And we read that Michael stands up and he kicks Satan down to the earth. Satan in his anger, in his great anger, um, it looks like he um, goes after Israel and they are chased into the hills where they are fed for um, 1260 days or uh, a time times and half a time. So three and a half years. So that's this period here going out. So I try to take that plus Revelation chapter 11 about the two witnesses. And it looks like the two witnesses that here in the middle ends for them as well, because you take uh, Satan, the dragon is allowed to kill them and they lay in the streets for four days, correct? Now, as I've mentioned before, uh, I believe that that is referring to the middle of the tribulation, not the end, because by the end of the tribulation, when you get out to uh, the times of uh, Armageddon and so forth, way out here, then you've got all kinds of crazy chaos that has been going on. You've got had the bold judgments and so forth. Um, all the waters turn to blood. I don't see satellite services or cell service working. So when they, the two witnesses after four days and they stand up and they ascend into heaven, folks aren't going to be able to have their, their cell phones out and snapping that, right? But the whole world is supposed to be watching and see this happen. And I think cameras will be there um, and people will have cell service. Plus the atmosphere is partying. People will be exchanging gifts and having a party. And when you got Armageddon, literally Armageddon is going on. Um, we've had man-sized hail fall from the skies. A series of earthquakes that were so powerful that they level all the mountains and um, they sink all the islands. All the waters turn to blood. Uh, CME is, has popped off the sun and has scorched men, and they're bitter and they're angry. Um, that is not a party atmosphere, folks. I don't see that going on at the end of the two witnesses' tenure. It makes more sense to me, as I've pointed out before, that the two witnesses somewhere um, shortly, and see, I've got a little date here for um, 10 days later. We get, if potentially you have the rapture on about the 14th, it could be the 15th, 16th, 10 days later is Yom Kippur. That could be when the two witnesses um, start their ministry. Okay, so you got a little time in between there in between because nothing says that the tribulation starts immediately after or at the rapture, folks. Nothing says that at all. So it's a, it's a seven year tribulation period, but we don't know exactly how long from one from the rapture to the very end um, what that is. It's going to be about seven years, though. It has to be because when you use the ancient Hebrew wedding traditions, the ancient Hebrew wedding tradition has it where um, the bridegroom goes and takes his bride and takes her to his father's house where they are shut in and they. Uh, have a celebration that lasts seven years. And then at the end of seven years, they open the doors to the public and announce, behold, the bride now wife. And um, then they have the public um, um, marriage supper of the Lamb. A lot of people have it. They think that it's a seven-year marriage supper of the Lamb thing, kind of, or whatever. No, it's a seven-year celebration. The marriage supper happens at the end of that, and it's public, and then guests are invited. The guests are who? Well, you have the resurrection of the Old Testament saints when Christ comes back, and you also have the, um, the Christian survivors who are also going to be Jews because it, it, there's new tribulation saints. You can call them Christian or whatever you want to call them, but for Claire, they are believers that came out of the tribulation. They're all guests and they're all being ushered in and you have the marriage supper of the Lamb because the marriage supper is about um, the bride and bridegroom. The bride is the church, um, traditionally called the Christians. Christian is anybody who's Christ-like or whatever, but just to distinguish the two, 
the bride and the bridegroom. And everybody else coming in is going to be the guests. And that's at the end. That is down this way um, when he returns. So what's fascinating here is I have a, a, a date that I put in. Um, let's see here. The cursor to show. Right in here, Nissan 1 happens about um, Nissan 1 happens about April 7th, which is interesting because when you count out um, 1260 days, you end up way out here. Okay, and, and then if you take April 7th and you count backward, you end up over here where the ministry for the two witnesses. So you have a little bit of squishy room here that I would like to nail down more where the things that happen are Revelation 11, 12, and 13. Okay, great, Dave. Don't make me read it. What's Revelation 11, 12, and 13? Well, you should read it, but off the top of my head, Revelation 11, 12, and 13 are going to be, um, here we go. We have the, the two witnesses. We have their, their ministry, okay? And then you have um, the woman ran out, out into uh, her nurse when she ran out into the wilderness and into the hills for time, times, and half a time, or 1260 days. And you also have, on the, at the second half here, you have the beast system, because what's happened in Revelation 12 is Satan gets kicked out of uh, heaven. Well, right now, it's not like he lives in heaven. Okay, he's he is in the streets like a lion roaring, seeking whom he may devour. He's the the god of this age, the scripture says. Um, so it's, he's been giving a, a short term lease on this because of sin and the curse uh, for a short time. He's the prince of the power of the air. So he is loose right now. He's not in chains yet. He's not in chains till Revelation. 19 and 20 when Jesus comes back okay before the kingdom so Satan is kicked down to earth and in his anger um, at some point in here he possesses Antichrist we can get into the whole thing I've got videos on it again you can check out we can get into the whole thing about uh, you know the wound of the eye and the wounds of the right arm and all this other kind of stuff and and whether or not that might happen and what that has to do with anything. But what we do know is that he possesses Antichrist, and that is what we call the beast. That's how you have the beast and the beast system. Satan has been um, working on this for centuries. The Antichrist comes in, and he's he and the false prophet are kind of establishing things and, and setting up this whole system. We're setting up the system now, folks, right? The Antichrist and the false prophet are alive and, and well now we just don't know exactly who they all are we can guess on um you know the false prophet but we don't know yet um but it'll be a global system both systems will be global whether it's the religious system or the government system the monetary system and so forth and the military machinery it'll all be global at some point so he possesses antichrist and here in in the middle of in the middle of the week as it were as christ refers to it starts the great tribulation he goes after after the jews antichrist is possessed and all this stuff happens he goes into the temple and he stops the sacrifices he and the false prophets set up a, a happy little statue or something to um that the Antichrist should be worshipped, and he sets up the beast system with the 666 and so forth. So if you're watching for 666 any time before that, especially now before the rapture, you're you're barking up the wrong tree because there's no beast. You have to have a beast system, or a beast before you can have a beast system. Okay. Part of what comes with the packages is is um, now now MacArthur was castigated years ago for this because um, he was saying words to this effect that. Uh, getting a number or, or getting a mark is not going to send you to hell. Um, and what that means is, is that uh, even if the beast system is the jab, if the beast system is a mark, if it's a tattoo, if the beast system is nanites in your body, if it's a mark on your forehead or in your right hand, if you were to go get that today, you are not going to hell for that. Why? It's not a 
mark of the beast yet. It might be a mark. It might be something bad. Might not. Might be ill-advised. Whatever. It's not the beast system mark of the beast yet because you have no beast. So part of what comes into it when you're reading uh, Revelation chapter 13 and 14, don't take my word for it. Be like the Bereans and go read it yourself. Is you worship the beast to get the mark there or there. Okay, that is what sends you to hell. It's the worship of the beast because you are um, not recognizing Jesus Christ as Lord and you're putting the Antichrist in place of the Lord and you are worshiping him instead. And that's what sends you to hell because to get the mark, you by getting the mark, you are saying, I'm in league with him. That's why in, in the Old Testament in Leviticus, tattoos were forbidden because it was a, it was a sign of, of ownership that you were you were um, putting yourself as placing yourself as owner um, in some respect or another to another or to another god or another human whatever. So it was forbidden. Uh, some people do it now because it's art or whatever, and they want to get a little you know get the uh, like a ring tattooed on their finger and do all kinds of funny little things, or even a verse or, or a tattoo of Jesus on their back or on their arm, whatever. But but uh, it's the marking of the body and in the um, thing behind it that's bad is 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 the ownership and who you're in liege who you're offering your liege to your 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 worship your service to okay servitude okay you put your servitude to the antichrist that is the beast system that is what the mark of the beast is is you're you're saying you know what i um we we saw this well you know um you know, I'll, I'll just put a mask on. It doesn't matter. I just got to run to the store and get a few things. I can't just, so I'll put the mask on because I don't want people looking at me weird. Um, I'll, I'll go and do this. I'll, I'll follow the aisles, the, the arrows down this aisle, and I'll do the zigzag thing, and I'll walk. I'll, I'll just do it because I, I need some groceries. I need some, you know, I, I can't get on the bus because I don't have, I have to have a mask on if I, if I or if I have to have a shot. If I don't have this stuff going on, then... Uh, you know, and I can't show somebody a card or whatever, then I, I can't get my kids to school, I can't get on the bus, um, I can't get on an airplane, I, so I need this stuff done, so I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Well, those things are, are um, comparatively insignificant compared, compared to the beast system. The beast system, this that all might be conditioning, okay? So we all see how that went, and a lot of people fell right in, just like, yeah, no problem, I'll, you know, yeah whatever and you're mean if you don't do it <clears throat> and they'll come up with bible verses even to tell you how mean you are if you don't do it and you don't love your fellow man well you know you must not love your fellow man and love your kids and love your family if you're not willing to go and take the mark so you can feed your kids and so you, know, so you can eat so you can buy gas for the car and stuff because there's no more dollars everything's digital and we know we see that this is coming down the pike real soon now that's not going to be the beast system yet but I'm sure in some fashion it will be adopted into the beast system where um, to make those things function properly for you by the time you get to the middle of the tribulation. And I say you generally, not you. If you're a believer, you're not going to be here. Don't sweat it. Uh, like Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 that you don't need to worry about that because you're not going to be caught off, off uh, unaware as a thief. Okay. But for the folks who are caught like a thief unaware, like, oh, somebody broke into my house. Look, at everything's scattered, and they turned the living room upside down. You're caught off guard like a thief. The window is broken. Um, you need to repent, give your life to Christ, and recognize him as Lord. And then hopefully, if, if you're watching a video like this, or this particular video, or something, and it's after the rapture, and you see this, you need to repent and not do that. Give your life to Christ. Even if it means um, starving for a season, or having to, you know, um, gnaw on the grass outside. I don't know what you have to do to eat or what go, you know, the black market somewhere or something, but you don't want the beast system because that, that will send you to hell. And that's all MacArthur was trying to convey back in the day was that it's, it's not, in and of itself, it's not a mark. In and of itself, it's not a tattoo. In and of itself, it's not a chip. In and of itself, it's none of these things that's going to send you to hell, but it's the worship that is attendant to buying into um, the system and having your body in some way identified with in liege with the beast as effectively your your lord the person in the throne in your life uh, that's going to send you to hell and you don't want any part of that that system all gets set up here um, as i said in in the middle 
and all that happens. And then we've got 1260 years. And when's it going to end? It's going to end, you know, right here in this little pocket of, of um, again, it'll be Tishri again when the Lord comes back and we've got uh, trumpets. I'm not sure if anything significant, if the day lands, anything significant happens at trumpets because we've already had the fulfillment of trumpets, Yom Teruah, up here uh, with the rapture. And so we count out the correct number of days. You've got Yom Kippur. Trumpets sets off 10 days of, of reflection and grieving and repentance and happiness and joy also because of, you know, redemption that comes from the Lord and so forth. So you've got 10 days of awe from trumpets to um, Yom Kippur. Um, so at the very end here, you've got trumpets, which is going to set off 10 days. Then you've got Yom Kippur. Um, that happens about uh, October 7th um, in 2030. And then you got tabernacles. Now the Lord could come back, Yom Kippur. Uh, he's going to come around. And um, so you've got 10 days between that and tabernacles. So the Lord could come back, Yom Kippur, possibly, right? He could come back then. And um, what does he do? He, he rescues the believers who are um, hidden up in the mountains. Okay. He takes care of the armies who are surrounded that area. As we read in the Old Testament, we read that in Zechariah. There's a little bit in Amos. We read it in Joel and so forth. Um, we know that it might be Petra, that there are saints there. Jesus is going to come down and he's going to bloody the horse's hooves in the bottom of his robe by taking out those Armageddon-type armies that are going to be there because uh, they want them. They want to take them out under the command of Antichrist. They want to kill those believers. Their rockets aren't getting through. They launch missiles. Whatever they do, they can't get in because the Lord is divinely protecting them there. And uh, so then we've got that. We've got the Valley of Decision where they're all wiped out and whatever believers and unbelievers are um, gathered together um, at that point. Well, let me point this out because one of the questions that came up was, no, the people who are taken up um, are the ones being judged. Uh, not the ones being saved. And this is our popular view among, um, well, other other groups. That that's not a rapture. The ones taken and ones left in, in uh, Matthew 24, the ones taken are the ones they're taken in judgment. Well, that's not the word, what the word taking means there. It means like to take away, to snatch away, to protect, like you rip a child out of harm's way is what it is. Your child's in the street, the car's coming in, you go and you go and you jerk that. That's what one's taken and one's left. That's what that means. In Matthew 24 but um, let me see if I can pull something up here real quick uh, let me do this I want to show I want to show you an example of of this if I may and it's um, patient you stand by as I try to figure this thing out here Whoop! I got it to pop up there okay this is what I want to show you okay Matthew 24 one's taken and one's left Okay, what a lot of people don't, yeah, you know, the comments, I know I mentioned something in this last video about this, but some people missed it or didn't watch or whatever, they just popped off with a response, they watched 10 minutes and then they said, no, 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 that's not right and here's why. What I want to um, point out here is that, I get myself here, because sometimes people like the eye contact thing. Um, and pardon me while I get a sip, but my throat's kind of oh, raspy. Is that Matthew 24, like the Olivet Discourse covers two chapters in Matthew, Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. You've got to read on. In fact, you can go into 26 for a verse or two. And that's the Olivet Discourse. Um, Matthew 24 describes one's taken and one's left. And in Matthew 25, all are taken. See what I've got written down here on on the on the chart um matthew 24 one's taken one's left we also see this in the weird wording in luke where it says you know where the eagles are gathered or where the buzzards are gathered um that kind of thing um okay so are believers going to be eaten by buzzards the ones left behind are the ones who are going to be uh, dead people okay mostly more than half the world gets wiped out during the tribulation. Another study. It's, it's one of my videos. Okay, 
So um, one's taken and one's left. Okay, so the believers get left behind and what? Where the carcasses are, so the believers are carcasses left behind? Or are you saying that carcasses are in heaven? Because if if the ones taken are taken in judgment are um, unbelievers, um, so there are there are now carcasses and there's going to be a feeding frenzy in heaven. I, I don't think so. It doesn't fit. For instance, in Revelation 19, we've got carcasses and we've got buzzards feasting off the bodies, right? That's what it's talking about in Matthew 24. The ones taken are the ones taken out of harm's way. Okay, because um, here's the thing: is, is is that we've got the sheep and the goats. See the little, the little, the little happy lamb and goat up here. <laughs> um, come on, folks! I worked hard on that, finding those little graphics. Anyway, um, the sheep and the goats judgment. Uh, it says in Matthew 25, the angels go out and they gather up everybody. So, do they gather up everybody, or do they gather up? Just unbelievers or just believers. If you have just one party or the other, pick one. I don't care. How does the other party get there? Call Uber? Maybe they maybe they send helicopters out to pick pick them up. Or if you know you have the valley of decision, um, like it's described in Joel or in Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats, one's taken and one's left, and they try to say, well, that the both events are the same. And they, they can't be, you've got two different events going on. Because in Matthew 24, you got one taken and one left. But Matthew 25, it describes everybody being taken. Which is it? Either there's a contradiction. Jesus contradicted himself in the Olivet Discourse, or you've got two different events. And I'm in favor of two different events. Um, all are taken. Uh, that can't be the rapture, clearly, because the context of Matthew 25, when you're reading it, all has to do with judgment. And, and some being cast into outer darkness, all the lambs are put to his right and the goats are put to the left, right? Well, how does that happen if they're all the same event? But in Matthew 24, you got one taken and one left. So you, there is a rapture between the lines in the subtext of Matthew 24. Is the word rapture in there? No. You guess what, folks? The word rapture is not in the Bible at all unless you're reading a Latin Bible. The word harpazo is in there in a couple places, one of them being in uh, First Thessalonians. But um, people like to play word games and, and play little gotchas and say, ha, 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 you know, the, the word rapture is not even in the Bible. I looked at my concordance and it's not there. Ha, ha, ha. All right. Funny joke. Ha, ha. Um, okay. Now time, time to grow up here and pay attention to what's going on in life around you. Um, and be honest with the scriptures. Get into the word. Study it. And rightly divide the word of God. And, and don't proof text. Try to prove your position. What you should be doing is, you should be proving your position against the word of God. And if where there's a difference, you need to reform your thinking. You need to revise your thinking. I had to do this. I changed um, quite a few things. I've been at this for, um, as I've commented before, I've been at this for over 50 years. Um, as a young lad in junior high school in 1971 was when um, I came to Christ. Almost right away, it was, you know, Within a year or so, I started getting into eschatology and end times because I heard people talking about rapture and second coming and all, and I didn't know what any of that stuff meant. So I started studying and reading and learning some bad stuff and learning some good stuff. The church I was at, I had a couple of really great people. Some people came from a more Presbyterian covenant, covenantal type of a background. So it was more, um, a little bit more amillennial type of a background. Um, my youth pastor, um, was a protege of, of Dr. MacArthur, and that's how he ended up being at our church uh, because our um, daughter of our church pastor at the time uh, knew MacArthur and, and knew about this guy, and so he came in. Um, so I, I learned pre trib, pre mill from him. So I, they would stand around sometimes talking, and it was like watching, you know, I'm, I'm like this, like I'm watching a tennis match. And I, taking notes and making mental notes and it was all some good stuff and it took some digging in and studying myself to arrive at where I'm at today. And um, so here we are. But I, I, I hate having a, a mystery. I hate having some things unsolved. So that's why I'm trying to drill down and, and trying to resolve some of these issues uh, because I, I, I want to figure it out. So one of the questions, one of the comments on here is that, no, the people who are taken are taken in judgment. Well, I, that's why I put this chart up, because hopefully this person or others who have the same question will come in here 
and maybe take a look and go, oh, I didn't think about that before. And let me take a look myself, not just take my word for it and go, oh, that's a good point. Bye, see ya, and walk away. But get into the word and dig in yourself and find out. These are two different two different events going on here. So you got to know the passage that you're in. Um, so I'm, I'm really straying way off path here. Um, I'm going to do um, a bunch of different videos, though, um, eventually. But I wanted to I wanted to point that out. Um, so this is going to get kind of long, so I'm going to jump off here at this point. I just want to answer a couple of those questions and, and reiterate that I'm not coming in here with a date, but I'm looking at possibilities for this year a rapture and where that ends up and how the math works and how it meets up in the middle and what we do with it. And and uh, look at the timelines, the time frames that we're looking at. We are looking at um, things like um, uh, where the two witnesses are and how their ministries play out for 1260 days, how Israel flees for 1260 days or a time, times and half a time, and how the whole period is for seven years. And it's, it, Daniel talks about a week, or, or at least the angel Gabriel gave to Daniel the prophecy about a week, the 70th week of Daniel. And I addressed last time already this this question about, well, why would God fling a prophecy, split it up and fling it out into the future? And I addressed this last time. You know, Jesus did it himself with his own, the prophecies concerning himself. And the Old Testament does too. Um, Isaiah um, 61 talks about this. Um, Gabriel to Luke, or in Luke to Mary, um, splits up by 2,000 years, Christ's first coming and second coming. There's just a couple of split up prophecies right there. So it's not unprecedented. It's not unprecedented. Verify for yourself whether it should be. And if you can figure out a different way to do it, you know, have fun with that. But um, we're going to um, close this off here. And I'll probably immediately do like, another video and pull some different notes together because there are a lot of questions coming, flooding in at me. And I want to answer these questions. But I don't want you to necessarily have to pause too much and I don't want a four hour video here so I'm going to break this off and then I want to um, launch into maybe some more questions and I've got some more thoughts on uh, ways that this can maybe be um, searched out a little bit more too so at this point uh, I'll sign off from here and we'll resume and look at this timeline again um, look at the chart again and I want to answer some more questions. I think it's easier to answer questions this way than I, I keep replying to some of them and I'm overwhelmed. I'm sorry. The last time I checked there's like 4,500 visits and a lot of comments. So I'm trying to reply to them and then the same question comes up again by somebody else. I'm going, okay, well, I, I've got to, I've got to use a, a broader shotgun method of broadcasting my answers to some of these and try to anticipate some and try to answer them. Um, I'm glad you all are engaged and, and I hope you're getting into the word. Keep trusting the Lord. Um, I, I think of that song, um, you know, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand, and indeed it is. Um, and then when he shall come with trumpet sound, may I then in him be found. And the same thing for you. May you be found in him when the trumpet sounds, the shofar sounds. I will sign off here and um, you have a, a blessed day. And I'm not sure when the second video will be up. Um, I might at some point go live if I can figure that out. I'm, I'm not a techno geek. Look at the generation I'm from, okay? So... I'm getting ready to turn in a few days, a um, few weeks, I will be turning 66 years old. So I'm not of that generation that, you know I, know, I know a lot of you youngsters just know how to swipe right and left and up and down and click on this and, and, and do whatever it is you do and you can make things happen really quickly. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not that much of a, a techno geek. So thank you for your patience and until next time.